Good morning. Please open your Bibles with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going to read verses 14 through 16. And as you're turning there, just a, a quick comment, two quick comments. First is that as we were reading um, Second Corinthians, you're probably thinking, whoa, what is the third heaven? <laughs> it's one of those things that shows up in the scriptures that people often wonder about. And the best explanation that I have seen of it, maybe there are better explanations, is I came across a reference in a book that said that in some ancient cultures, they thought about from the ground to the sky as the first heaven. And the word heaven is often used interchangeably in the scriptures. From the sky to the moon was the second heaven. And then from the moon to the abode of God was the third heaven. So the third heaven is just God. It's just not God, but heaven, the, the dwelling place of God. So probably a good idea not to think too hard about that language and just see it as heaven itself, the throne room. Of God. The other comment I wanted to make is that our study of 1 Thessalonians uh, has been going at a kind of a strange pace. Uh, a verse here and then a bunch of verses at a time, and a verse here and a bunch of verses at a time. And I wanted to explain why that is the case. And it's that, it's that way because if you read 1 Thessalonians chapters 1 through 3, you'll find in those chapters that Paul's really just talking to the Thessalonians. He's really just speaking to them. It's a letter. It's a letter written from one person to a group of people, and as we write in our emails and text messages and such things, we talk to each other. And 1 Thessalonians 1 through 3 is largely Paul saying, I was worried about you. I've heard a good report about you. I'm encouraged. I thank God for you, and I hope that you're encouraged too. And he says that in a variety of different ways uh, throughout the first three chapters. And so as a preacher... You have to preach these chapters in which Paul is not really teaching much. He's not setting something before them and explaining it. He kind of mentions things as he goes in his his speech, in his speaking uh, to them. And so we have, at times, taken a large set of verses where Paul talks to them. And at other times, such as today, we highlight something that Paul mentions in passing and we look at it in light of the fullness of the scriptures. So today we're going to do that again, where we, we pick out something that Paul mentions so that we can understand it better in light of the fullness of the word of God. Let us read our text, which is 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. Paul says, For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and drove us out, and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them at last." Now, what we're going to focus on this morning is Paul's mention of the measure of the sins of the Jews and the wrath of God upon them. We're going to, in subsequent sermons, focus more on verse 14, because Paul talks about suffering there and then picks it up again after his discussion of Israel and sin and wrath. So we'll come back to 14 as we move forward into chapter 3 in other sermons. But right now, How can we understand Paul's reference to Israel's sin and God's wrath? How can we apply it to our own lives as well? Well, consider four points with me that will take us through this text and the sermon. Four points. Number one, the first point is entitled, The Measure of Israel's Sin. The Measure of Israel's Sin. Paul refers to the measure of Israel's sin in second in 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 16 and he talks about God's wrath on them. Well, although Paul briefly mentions this, he does get specific about a few things. He tells us what sins he has in mind. He says that the Jews killed the prophets, 
The Jews killed Jesus. The Jews drove us out from Judea. And the Jews oppose the preaching of the gospel everywhere it goes and everywhere they are. If there are Jews in a town and the gospel comes there, they oppose it. Not all of them, but they often oppose it. And so therefore they are opposed to Jesus and everyone who would proclaim the name and message of Jesus. So to understand what Paul is referring to, because Paul's picking on something, picking up something, and running with it, something that has a large history in the history of redemption and the scriptures themselves. To, to understand this, we have to, what we have to do is read a variety of texts and put together the big picture. So please turn with me to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. What does it mean that Israel is filling up the measure of their sins? Well, Jesus has spoken about this long before Paul did. And we read in Matthew chapter 23, verses 29 through 33, these words from Jesus. Matthew 23, beginning in verse 29. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus you witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up, then, the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How are you to escape being sentenced to hell? We find, then, that when Paul talks about the Jews filling up the measure of their sins, he's referring to something that started well before his time, something that began in the past, something that Jesus speaks about and refers to. Jesus mentions something even before his time. So Paul refers to his day and the Thessalonians. Jesus refers to his day and the Pharisees of his day. And he refers back to the fathers who killed the prophets before that. So you see this ongoing process throughout history, throughout successive generations, in which the Jewish people are rejecting God's messengers, God's message, and then God's Christ, and then God's apostles who preach the message of that Christ. And so Paul is picking up on a, a history as well as the scriptures of the past. Now, in Jesus' time, well, Paul refers to killing Jesus and the prophets. Of course, in Jesus' time, Jesus had not yet been killed. And so Jesus only refers to killing the prophets. Prophets, But Paul sees the Jews persecuting the Thessalonians as continuing something that began long ago. And this fits well with Paul's expression in 1 Thessalonians 2.16 when he says, "...so as always to fill up the measure of their sins." In other words, he says, this is what the Jews do generation after generation after generation. They oppose the Christ and all who proclaim the Christ. They always successively, continually fill up the measure of their sins. So between Paul and Jesus, we find that Israel's rejection of the Christ and the good news of the Christ, the gospel, is a large-scale filling up an ongoing large-scale filling up of the measure of their sins, which began in the Old Testament. And we can find it there in the Old Testament as well. In fact, we need to turn to the Old Testament. So I would ask you to please turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. In Isaiah 6, Isaiah is told to say something. He's given a message. And we see this in verses 9 and 10. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. And he said, Go and say to this people, go and say to Israel, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and, their, and blind their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. We see here in these verses in Isaiah that God pronounces curses on Israel for their sins, for their rejection of his prophets and his law. And one of these curses is that many of them, 
In fact, a large portion of the Jews would reject the coming of the Christ because they would not understand it. They would not understand the coming of the Christ, and so therefore they would reject him and oppose him. Now, let's move back to the New Testament. Turn to Matthew chapter 13. God fulfills this prophecy. He fulfills this promise through Jesus teaching the people of Israel in parables. Teaching the people in parables accomplishes this. The elect will understand and believe it. The rest will misunderstand it and disbelieve it, and they will be condemned for it. Jesus himself refers to Isaiah 6 and explains why he teaches in parables. Read with me Matthew 13, verses 13 to 17. Jesus said, This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says you will indeed hear but never understand, and you will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. As we add verse to verse to verse, portion of scripture to portion of scripture, the puzzle pieces begin to to paint a large-scale picture, a huge theme in the history and plan of redemption and a big part of the scriptures. That God called the nation of Israel to be the family of his Christ. It begins in Genesis 12 with the calling of Abraham. Abraham, from your descendants, through one of your offspring, will the nations of the earth be blessed. The Christ, the one who blesses the nations, will come from your family. And then later in the development of Israel's history, God tells them, a portion of you, children of Abraham, will disbelieve and reject the Christ, and a remnant of you will embrace and believe in the Christ and enjoy the benefits of his covenant and his kingdom. Paul discusses this at length in Romans 9 through 11. I'd like you to turn with me to Romans chapter 11, and we'll just read two verses from a large discussion where Paul Paul raises these questions of if God was going to raise up this people according to the flesh in order to give birth to the Messiah, but a large portion of them would just reject him and God would condemn them for rejecting him, why then does he find fault, etc.? All these questions. What advantage then is there in being a Jew? Well, there is much advantage. You have the law, you have the prophets, the Christ was born according to the flesh. Paul goes through all these things. And he explains in Romans 11, verses 7 through 8, He says, what then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. So from Isaiah 6 to Matthew 13 to Matthew 23 to Romans chapter 11 to other verses that we have not looked at or cited By the time you get to 1 Thessalonians 2.16, you see there's a huge history behind what Paul is saying. The Jews began to reject God and his Christ long ago. Long ago. They've been in this for generations. They've been working in this iniquity for many, many years. They rejected the prophets. They rejected the Christ, the Son of God. They killed him. They continue to reject the Christ and his church and his messengers and his gospel. This would have been an encouragement of sorts to the first Thessalonians, more an explanation than an encouragement to say, what's happening to you is not unique to you. What's happening to you did not start with you. You are sharers. You are participating in something much larger than you that began long before you. And in a sense, it is a badge of honor to suffer for Christ's sake. Blessed are you when you are persecuted for my sake, Jesus said. And so Paul wants them to know 
This is happening because God foretold it would happen, that the Jews would reject the Christ and the people of the Christ and the message of the Christ. And the fact that you're being persecuted for these reasons simply validates and proves that you belong to Jesus Christ and to his people. To complete our understanding of what Paul refers to here, we need to consider his statement that the wrath of God has come upon Israel. What does it mean when Paul says that the wrath of God has come upon Israel? We can see their sin. It began long ago, and it's, it's at a fever pitch. It's at a height of sorts in Paul's day. What does it mean that the wrath of God has come upon them in a past tense? Well, this does not mean that the wrath of God has come, it's complete, and it's done now. It means that something has been initiated against Israel. The wrath of God has been inaugurated against Israel, and it is growing. It is not something that began and stopped, and it's completed. It is something that has definitively come upon them in a a public and complete way. What does this mean? How so? Well, Jerusalem had not yet been destroyed when Paul wrote this letter, and so that is not what Paul is referring to, although that was an element of God's judgment against Israel. But we see God's judgment against unbelieving Israel in a variety of ways. You see it during the ministry of Jesus Christ, when a portion of Israel refuses to believe his message and hates him and kills him. God's withholding of his mercy from them is a form of judgment upon them for which they are responsible. And so their sins, they are held accountable for their sins and the hardness of their hearts. God left them in that hardness, and that was his judgment against them. So also, when Jesus died and the temple curtain was ripped, what's left for the Jews according to the flesh at that point? They have an empty holy of holies, no ark, no glory, no presence, no sacrifice for sins. They have nothing. God is not with them according to the flesh. God is not with them as the descendants of Abraham. He has abandoned them in a sense. He has, they have broken their covenant with him, and he has poured out his judgment upon them, not abandoned in the sense of, of releasing of his commitments and breaking his promises, but rather he is pouring out the judgment he foretold he would according to his covenant. And so the judgment of God begins during Jesus' ministry. It happens when Jesus dies, and it continues on. The day of Pentecost is a judgment against Israel according to the flesh. How so? Because now the oracles of God, now the word of God and the blessing is being pronounced in the tongues of the nations. Now it is the nations who are being blessed. Now it is the nations who are speaking the word of God. Because at Pentecost, people were not speaking unintelligible languages. They were speaking the word of God in their own tongues. And so as the Jews in Israel, in Jerusalem, see the nations praising God and proclaiming his word not in their language, it is a judgment upon them that you people, according to the flesh, the children of Abraham, You need to repent and believe just like the Gentiles. And of course, the destruction of Jerusalem was a pouring out of wrath and judgment upon them. The temple curtain was ripped. The Holy of Holies was empty. The gospel was now in all the languages of the world. And circumcision was nothing. Their great badge of honor. We are the circumcised. Paul says in two places in the scriptures, it is nothing. Everything they boasted in, wrongly, everything they boasted in, everything they trusted in to oppose Jesus Christ, it was empty, it was vanity, and that was part of God's judgment upon them. And so Paul wants the Thessalonians to understand not only why they are being persecuted, but he wants the Thessalonians to understand that their persecutors have been judged, are being judged, and will be judged in a full and final way at the last judgment. And they will be extra liable. They will be judged all the worse for their rejection of Christ and their persecution of the people of Jesus Christ. They did not believe, and they will experience eternal wrath, which they now have a foretaste of. So as I said at the beginning of this sermon, in 1 Thessalonians 1-3, through Paul several times just mentions something. 
He doesn't go into detail about it, but we can often use the scriptures to get a much fuller understanding of what Paul is saying. The Jews reject the Christ and the people of the Christ, and they will be punished for it. Well, this concludes our first point, now that we've done our best to have a good understanding of Paul's words. The second point is the measure of man's sin. The measure of man's sin. One thing that we have not specifically addressed is the terminology or the metaphor, the imagery that Paul uses of filling up a measure. Filling up a measure of sin. And I've saved that until now because throughout the scriptures, Israel is not the only one that is described as filling up the measure of sin. What does this imagery refer to? Well, think about a Japanese garden where you have a bamboo pipe with water and it fills a bucket. And then when the bucket fills up, it tips over and then it tips back up and the water comes through the bamboo pipe and it continues to fill it and to tip it, to fill it and to tip it. The bucket is, is finite. It only fills so much and then it pours out. It has a measure. So also, when the scriptures talk about the measure of our sins, it's referring to the fact that God has decreed, God has foreordained that our sins will fill the bucket to a certain point, and then the bucket of wrath is poured out upon us. And it is not only Israel that is threatened with the wrath of God and the filling up of the measure of their sins. This is the image used to describe man's sin and God's wrath against mankind. We sin. And we sin, and we fill up the bucket. We fill up the vat of our sins. We fill up the measure because it only holds so much. In fact, it's only designed to hold so much. God has set the limits of that measure. And when our sin fills up that measure, the bucket tips and God's wrath is poured out upon us. Now, we see this at pivotal points in history. Man's iniquity fills up. And God sends the flood to destroy man. Man's iniquity fills up at the Tower of Babel, and God confounds and confuses the nations and their languages. We see this also in the conquest of Canaan. I'll read a verse to you from Genesis 15, verse 16. In Genesis 12 and the the ensuing chapters, the subsequent chapters, God promises the land of Canaan to Abraham and his descendants. And in Genesis 15, verse 16, God says to Abraham, Your descendants shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. God is saying, I promise this land to you now, but your children will not possess it until the fourth generation. What's going to happen between now and then? The Canaanite nations are going to fill up the measure of their sins, and your children, your descendants, will be the agents of my wrath to judge them. Your descendants, the Israelites, as they conquer this land, will be exterminating the unholy pollutants in a holy place. And it's very important that we understand the conquest of Canaan in this way because many question the merciless violence of the Israelites against the Canaanites. Why why was the conquest of Canaan of such a nature? Harem warfare, no mercy warfare. Well, it's because Canaan was promised to God's people as a holy possession and sanctuary of God's presence and people. And it was occupied by cannibalistic, child-sacrificing, bestial idolaters. They were pollutants in God's sanctuary and needed to be destroyed when they filled up the measure of their sins. And so Israel's violence against them was a holy violence against an unholy uh, set of tribes. This happens again when Israel and Judah fill up the measure of their sins and God sends the Assyrians to destroy Israel and the Babylonians to destroy Judah, but it happens also to Assyria and Judah where Assyria Assyria, uh, Assyria commits atrocities against mankind. They do terrible, horrible, wicked things. And what do the prophets say to them? It's coming for you. And they fill up the measure of their sins, they are destroyed. Babylon, and both Assyria and Babylon, they, they puff themselves up with, prize, with pride. Look at what I have done. As Habakkuk says in chapter 2, they praise their net. They capture people in their net, and they offer sacrifices to their net. They praise their horses. They praise their weapons. They praise themselves and their military prowess. Their sins fill up the measure. And then they, too, are utterly destroyed. The point that we are making here 
is that throughout history and throughout the scriptures, whether it's the flood, Babel, Canaan conquest, Israel's exile, or the punishment of Israel's exilers, or the hardening of the Jews against the prophets, against Jesus, the church, all of these things are warnings and examples to the entire world that the God of justice that they know by nature will not fail to see and to punish their sins. We are seeing small-scale outpourings of wrath and judgment as warnings of a a coming full-scale judgment against mankind. And this brings us to our third point. Number three, the measure of your sins. The measure of your sins. It's very easy to point our fingers at Israel. It's even easier to point our fingers at Canaanites and at Assyrians and at Babylonians. Oh, those wicked ancient peoples. But the scriptures are quite clear that these small-scale judgments are indicators, reminders, assurances, warnings of a future and final judgment that will reach to Every single person that has ever existed and every thought and every intention and every word and every deed and everything that we haven't done that we ought to have done, every last action, every last sin of every person that has ever lived in the entire world, there is a judgment that will extend to all of us, a judgment that will extend to you. What this means is that each one of us is filling up the measure of our own sins, Each one of us is pouring into our bucket sin upon sin upon sin, a bucket that will be poured out on us. God's word says in Daniel 8, verse 23, in apocalyptic language, and at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, and then it goes on, to say that our transgressions are filling up a bucket of wrath. Our sins are filling up a measure of judgment against ourselves, and the end times are marked by the reaching of that limit. Now, brothers and sisters and friends, the great peril of this message is that we have said that the outpouring of God's judgment marks pivotal points in history, redemptive history. Where are we on that timeline? We must realize that the scriptures tell us these are the last days. 1 John says it explicitly. These are the last days. And so what is left? Are there there little buckets yet to be poured out before the big bucket? Well, surely God can, can judge and send wrath against people and nations here and now. He certainly can. But these are the last days. The sun has come. The sun has risen. The sun has ascended. And so we are told that all that remains is for that last and final bucket to be poured out upon the world. This raises an urgent and pressing question, which we heard earlier from Jesus himself. We read this earlier. Jesus himself said, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? If we all stand with a bucket above our heads of our own sins, constantly filling it up to the measure, how will we escape pulling that chain and the bucket being poured out upon us? How are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Everywhere I go, that bucket follows me. Everywhere I cannot escape it because it is my sins that have filled it up and I cannot escape my sins. Do not be deceived by your own heart, by the fact that you enjoy God's mercy and kindness every day in sunshine and rain and health and heartbeats. Do not think that all is well. Paul says in Romans chapter 2, Do you presume on the riches of God's kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his works. If God will render to each one according to his works, God will pour out your bucket on your head. And Paul asks, do you presume? Do you take for granted the riches of God's kindness and forbearance and patience? The riches, in other words, the the multitude. God is being so patient 
so kind, so good to give you so much time, to give you so many heartbeats, to give you so much health, to give you so much sunshine, to give you so much rain, to give you all these things day after day. Are you presuming upon those things, thinking all is well? There is no bucket of wrath for me. There is no measure for my sins. Paul says that is a hard and impenitent heart that is storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath. God will render to each one according to his works. So we return to Jesus' question. How are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Well, this brings us to our fourth and final point. The measure of salvation. The measure of salvation. The wrath of God is his sure and certain justice poured out on a wicked object. The wrath of God is his sure and certain, perfect, unstoppable justice poured out on a wicked object. It is his everlasting punishment upon the unrepentant and unbelieving. But let us give thanks to our God and our Father that he sent our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you're not in 1 Thessalonians, turn back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. In our verses in chapter 2, Paul mentions the wrath of God has come upon Israel. But this isn't the first time that he's mentioned the wrath of God in this letter. Do you remember what he said in chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, about the Thessalonians? 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10, he said, For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God. You turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. As we said when we studied this verse, it is the coming wrath, the certain wrath, the wrath on its way, the wrath that is waiting for us. But Paul says of the Thessalonians and therefore of all believers, what are we waiting for? We're waiting for Jesus because he's delivered us from that wrath. And so we're, we're awaiting a reunion. We're awaiting seeing our Savior. And God teaches us in his word that Jesus Christ died on the cross. And what did he do? Why did he die? On the cross, the buckets of our sin, the buckets of wrath for our sins were poured out upon him. So that when it comes to us and that chain is pulled and the bucket tips over our heads, there's not even a drop in it for us. Not a single drop. Because all of our sins have been taken away and all of the judgment for our sins and the condemnation for our sins has already been poured out upon Jesus Christ on the cross. Because he died. He endured the sentence. He died. And he rose again victorious. We filled up the measure of our sins and Jesus Christ drank the cup of the wrath of God to its fullest. And so the measure of salvation reaches to the full measure of our sin. A measure is a finite amount. If it's not, it's, it's not measurable. It's not a measure. A measure is a specific amount. If someone says two tablespoons, you don't put a cup or a teaspoon. You put in two tablespoons. When you dose medicine for your child, you are very careful, aren't you? Okay, this much and no more in the little cup. You go to the measure and no more. Our sins, there is a measure of our sins. Does the measure of salvation reach to all of them? Does the measure of salvation cover all of our sins, all of my sins, all of my wicked thoughts, all of my wicked desires, all of my wicked words, all of my wicked actions, all of the wickedness that I have perpetrated against God, all of the things that I have not done that I ought to have done? Does, does the measure of salvation reach to all of those things? And the word of God tells us, yes, yes, yes. The measure of forgiveness extends to all our sins. 
And the measure of Christ's righteousness is likewise all the righteousness we need to stand in the very presence of God. The measure of our salvation in forgiveness and righteousness is perfect and complete. And you know what's beautiful is that God teaches us these things not just in his word written, but as we mentioned last week, in his word made visible to us. Where does God teach us that his son has entered judgment and death and risen victorious for all who trust in him? Where does God teach us visibly that Christ has died and forgiven our sins and we are righteous in him? Both baptism and the Lord's Supper say nothing else. There's nothing else they say other than these things. Jesus has gone into death. Jesus has gone into the grave. Jesus has endured judgment. Think about the flood judgment poured out upon the earth. Think about the crossing of the Red Sea and the the collapsing of the ocean upon the Egyptians. These things are are pre-pictures. They are types. They are images of what Jesus did. Jesus went into those waters of judgment. Jesus went underneath death. Jesus Christ suffered for us. And in baptism, we say, I have died in Jesus Christ, and I have risen again in him. And when my body dies... I will be raised unto glory on that last day. So baptism teaches us that the measure of salvation is perfect. Jesus went into death and rose victorious. And of course, in the Lord's Supper, what are we told? What are we shown? This is my body broken for you. This is my blood poured out for you. For what? What does it accomplish? For the remission. That's the taking away of sins. Think about that word remission. A mission is ascending. To emit, to send out. So emission, sending out. Or a mission is ascending. Transmission, to send across a distance. A remission, take it back. (laughs) Get it back. Remission, take away, remove. Remove, remission. It's the same word. My blood is poured out for you for remission of sins, for taking away, for cleaning up, for removing, for forgiving your sins. Jesus Christ drank the cup of curse so that we could drink the cup of blessing. Jesus experienced the full measure of God's wrath for our sins so that we could experience the full measure of his goodness and his mercy and his love towards us. What can we say in conclusion? Three things, briefly and together. Number one, woe to the sinner. Woe to the sinner. A woe is a curse. To put it in as plain English as possible, a woe is a bad thing that's coming for you. Woe to the sinner. It's a warning. You are under a curse. The bucket over your head is filled with the measure of your sins. And you cannot remove them. The spilling of your blood will not be the remission of your sins. Only the spilling of Christ's blood. Woe to the sinner. Do not presume upon God's kindness. Do not presume that the sun shining and the rain falling and your lungs expanding and contracting and your heart beating every day, that this means that all is well. You can presume upon God's kindness in Jesus Christ. Secondly, woe to the sinner who rejects Jesus Christ. Woe to the sinner who rejects Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. We see in the case of the Israelites that they are liable to a much more severe judgment because they were given so many privileges and blessings. What advantage hath the Jew? Much in every regard, Paul says. He goes through the list. Above all and from their line, according to the flesh, was born the Christ, Jesus He lived among them. He ministered to them. He died among them. He rose among them. His apostles went to them first everywhere they went. And so those Jews who rejected Jesus Christ were liable of a much more severe judgment. What about the children 
and the teenagers and the spouses and the friends who come and they hear and they listen and Jesus Christ is put before them Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And once a month, Jesus Christ is visibly portrayed before them in the Lord's Supper. And from time to time in baptisms, again, Jesus Christ is visibly put before them. Children, teenagers, spouses, friends, you are storing up wrath for yourself. You are rejecting Jesus Christ by not repenting of your sins and believing in him. And you are adding to the sins that the whole world commits, the great sin of rejecting Jesus Christ. Woe to the sinner who rejects Jesus Christ. And you may think, I'm not rejecting him. If you are not confessing his name, you are. If you are not repenting of your sins and calling upon the name of the Lord, you are rejecting Jesus Christ because Jesus calls you. He calls you to himself. God commands the whole world everywhere to repent. And so by not obeying that command, by not responding to that call, you are rejecting Jesus Christ. There's no neutral ground. There's no wait and see. Woe to the sinner who rejects Jesus Christ. Thirdly and lastly, I'm just going to quote a verse to you, Romans 4, 7 to 8, which cites Psalm 32, 1 to 2. We've said, woe to the sinner. Woe to the sinner who rejects Jesus Christ, recognizing those are curses. Now, Romans 4, 7 to 8. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Are you blessed? Are you blessed? There's an, there's an easy way to answer this. Are your lawless deeds forgiven? Then yes, you are blessed. Are your sins covered? Then yes, you are blessed. Are you a man against whom the Lord will not count your sin? Then yes, you are blessed. Imagine that. The Lord will not count my sin against me. Why? Because I have pleaded with him and he said, okay, or because it was his initiation. It was he who sent his son. It was he who called us to him. It was he who lavished this grace upon us. And so I know with confidence he will not count my sins against me because judicially my deeds are gone. My lawless deeds are gone. They're forgiven. My sins are covered. God says, what sins? I have forgotten them because that is my covenant with you. I will remember your sins no more. Jesus poured out the bucket on himself. Jesus drank the cup to the last of his own will. And so God says, there is no bucket for you. There is no cup for you, at least not of judgment. We have a baptism and we have a Lord's Supper that declare our freedom from this judgment, our freedom from this condemnation. Brothers and sisters, let us give thanks to the Lord our God who has rescued us from the coming wrath that is due to us for our sins. Let us be thankful that the measure of salvation extends to every last one of our sins and to every last sin of everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord because the scriptures tell us, and all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Think about that word that we say all the time in in church, saved. Saved from what? from the wrath to come, saved from the condemnation that is due, to the me- due for the measure of our sins. Oh, thank the Lord that blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, how thankful are we, how grateful are we that Jesus Christ has endured the wrath that we deserved, that Jesus Christ has suffered the sentence that is rightly ours. How we thank you for our salvation in him. How we thank you for your goodness and your kindness to us, undeserving, wicked sinners. And we pray that you would help us to live like those who have been saved, to live like those who have been delivered, to live like those who have been rescued from wrath and judgment.
And we pray that you would bless us this day, that you would save our children, that you would save our young ones, our teens, that you would save our adult children, that you would save our unbelieving spouses, that you would save our unbelieving family members, that you would save the visitor, the one who is here this day. We ask that you would pour out salvation. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.